The situation in the United States and Europe is actually pretty good because we have a culture of donation uh, which is very generous and very selfless. This is not the case for the rest of the uh, world necessarily. In many countries the culture is very different. Sometimes it's stigmatized or sometimes it's not the done thing. And then there are parts of the world that you just don't have the medical infrastructure to, win, uh, to perform something as complicated as organ transplantation. And just to give you a, a brief idea of what we're talking about, um, the topic is organ transplantation, which is a miracle of modern science and medicine. And the need for donor organs is greater than ever. As of April 2018, there are more than 114,000 people on the U.S. wait list for an organ transplant, and each day 20 people die waiting for a transplant. Uh, in this talk, our special guest today is Dr. Corkut Yugen, uh, who is director of the Organ Reengineering Lab at Massachusetts General Hospital, who will discuss the current needs and challenges of organ transplantation and the exciting new research that is currently underway to recover unusable organs for transplantation. Um, after his presentation, uh, Dr. Yugen will be joined by his colleagues, Dr. Heidi Ye, Surgical Director of the Pediatric Transplant Program at MGH, and Dr. Basak Yugen, uh, Assistant Bioengineer at Massachusetts General Hospital and also Professor at Harvard uh, Medical School as well. Um, and so we're really excited. They'll be here to answer your questions um, about organ transplant, uh, the process, uh, and also the newest research on the process of organ reengineering. So uh, we're going to get started with a quick, um, uh, we'll transition to, uh, to Dr. Yugen who will give us uh, his presentation. This is not intended as a detailed scientific talk. I want to show you lots of control groups and Excel charts and I won't get into the statistics or anything. It's most of the figures are illustrations to make my point, hopefully. Um, it's also not intended as a comprehensive review of the field. It's more of like things that are, we are focused on and that, that, are, that I'm more aware of, let's put it that way. Um, so yes, transplantation is a miracle of modern science, um, but it's not a new thought. Um, to make a crude and imperfect analogy, but it makes the point. Uh, when, your car, when your car breaks down, whether you need a new carburetor or a tire or an engine, it's easy to take it to the shop and um, just take the replacement part off the shelf and put it back in. Um, and it works almost as good as new. Uh, people have been obsessed with this idea of doing the same thing for ourselves, for humans, uh, when a, a limb or organ fails as well. Um, there are actually um, records of, anecdotal records of people attempting this throughout history. Um, the first credible report is from the second century BC. It's an Indian surgeon. He tried doing skin grafts, uh, some form of rhinoplasty. Um, but of course it did not work. Uh, modern medicine started to take a dig at this in the early 20th century, in the very early 1900s, when they actually started testing these in animals again. And it turned out not to be as um, easy as, uh, as initially thought of. It's not a car, it's a human. Um, part of the reason is transplantation surgery is a really complicated thing, and it required a lot of basic technologies and capabilities to be there. One example, for instance, is anesthesia. When you're doing transplantation, the patient needs to be under four hours and hours. You can just give them a, a bottle of scotch and hope that they survive through it, like the way surgeries used to be done. Um, so the first picture there is actually from the Etherdome at MGH, where the first uh, anesthesia was done. There's still a beautiful tour of it. If you guys want to come and uh, do, uh, there's like a little museum and everything too. It's very nice. Um, so yes, early attempts started with uh, early failures and then successes at animals. Uh, one of the things they uh, noticed at the time was what we now call rejection. So um, our bodies have this very sophisticated defense systems to survive the jungle. When you're bitten or when your um, infectious agents try to uh, enter your body and you know, harm you, um, our systems are very well tuned up to prevent that from happening. The problem is when you put an organ in uh, the recipient, the recipient's immune system also thinks that's a foreign body and starts to attack us. So, so you basically need to somehow convince the body that this is okay, uh, we are trying to save you from dying here, please stop attacking this nice organ we put in. So for that, we actually had to understand the biology of immunology. Um, this is Peter Medawar, a British uh, biologist who figured this out and of course won a Nobel Prize for it. Um, 
So in the early 50s is the first immunosuppression drugs actually come online. Cortisone, something you can just buy off the pharma pharmacy today, was a breakthrough at the time. Um, and then we got better with these uh, more and more modern and more uh, powerful immune suppression medications that actually enable this to happen uh, between uh, different people. Um, the first successful transplant is actually another local uh, event. Uh, it was at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in 1954, 1954 by uh, another local kid, Joe Murray, um, who of course also won a Nobel Prize. Um, and the first uh, people who got the transplantation were two twin brothers. Uh, it was a kidney transplantation and at the time I think they went with the twins because they didn't know the immunology and the drugs again medications weren't ready for immune suppression. Uh, what they were trying to do is get all the surgical parts right so this is a very complicated operation the whole field of vascular biology actually had to be developed so that you can recover an organ um, quickly uh, without harming it um, and put it back in a short amount of time and it can handle uh, the pressure of the blood once you put the organ back in. So all those technologies had to be there. Um, the first, first transplantation was in 1954 and then there, there was the second one and there was the tenth one and we are today at um, a situation where tables have reversed. Organ transplantation is now such a successful therapy, the success rates are over 90 percent after one year now, uh, that it's, it's the miracle cure. You have a failing organ, we can fix it. Um, there are some estimates that over 30% of the deaths in the United States can actually be postponed significantly if we had enough organs for transplantation. The 30% figure can be an exaggeration, but you kind of get the point that almost in all chronic diseases where it's just one organ or one tissue failing, if we had a replacement, we could actually prevent the patient from dying. Um, so the problem now is that we don't really have enough organs for everybody in need to be transplanted. There is such a thing as an organ waiting list where if you need an organ, you are put on that list and you are basically hoping and praying that one becomes available for you. Um, the situation in the United States and Europe is actually pretty good because we have a culture of donation uh, which is very generous and very selfless. This is not the case for the rest of the uh, world necessarily. In many countries the culture is very different. Sometimes it's stigmatized or sometimes it's not the done thing. And then there are parts of the world that you just don't have the medical infrastructure to, win, uh, to perform something as complicated as organ transplantation. So, um, of course the obvious thing you think of is, well, if more people donate then we will have more organs and that of course is good. But that's only half of the problem. Um, if you look at the numbers, what we notice is that part of the issues, is we can only utilize a fraction of the organs that are actually donated. Uh, a good number of them we can't use because essentially the organ has to be in perfect condition to be transplanted. If it's slightly injured, so if the donor's heart has stopped and there has been more than a few minutes afterward, the organ is damaged, we can't use it. Uh, if the donor is not healthy, for instance some fat, which means my liver is fat, which problem means my liver is not ideal for transplantation. So you can't really risk putting it in a uh, sick person to start off with. Um, I'm an engineer, I'm actually a chemical engineer that somehow found himself in the field of transplantation which I'm very um, happy and it was a very surprising but serendipitous thing that happened to me. Um, but to me it's a failure of technology. So the way we do organ transplantation now is we recover the, um, the donor organ, we put it in this uh, bag of cold preservation medium, put it, the whole thing in a box of ice and run to wherever the recipient is. I, I mean run because you literally have hours, you have just a few hours for the heart, uh, for the liver you have about 12 hours, so Heidi just jumps in a propeller plane or a helicopter and runs to wherever the recipient is. Um, now, uh, this is still the, this preservation uh, technology, which is the special media called Belzer's uh, Preservation Solution or University of Wisconsin Solution, is still a wonderful and amazing technology that enabled transplantation to happen the way we do it today. It just has been become, become a bottleneck after 50 years or so. Um, so the problem is, um, so you put the organ on a box of ice, uh, that cools it down, which means it's functioning much more slowly, its needs are much reduced and therefore it can last not minutes but hours. 
that is wonderful, but the organ is still essentially suffocating in that little box. That box doesn't have a new source of oxygen, it doesn't have new nutrients, eventually it runs off what was there and starts to die, and that takes hours. Ours is still great, um, but it's not uh, as much time as we would ideally want. The second problem is because during preservation the organ is injured, it has to be in perfect uh, state when we first recover it so that it can take this additional punishment to it and still function when you put it in this uh, sick recipient, uh, which means we can only use only the organs that are in perfect condition. Um, so we have some estimates that we could, if we could actually take these organs that are currently injured and make them transplantable by better preservation technology, we could essentially double the number of organs we can transplant today, which means we take care of the current unmet demand. Of course, the need is so much that there will be more demand, but um, at least we'll have made a good play. So what the field has been working on in the last uh, 20 years or so, I would say, is uh, this technology called machine perfusion. Um, these are essentially artificial bodies for the organs, um, and they provide the all key functions. Um, in the videos behind me, there's a video in the heart that's uh, pumping in the device. Um, and um, what these things do is they have a pump that provides the circulation um, if they, or supports the heart doing that. Um, there is a blood or blood-like media that provides all the nutrients and then there is an oxygenator which uh, performs the work, the, the duties of the lung to provide there is enough oxygen to make sure there is enough oxygen to the organ that's being preserved. Uh, these are functional preservation techniques which means that the organ isn't suffocating from a lack of oxygen or nutrients the way it was in the back of ice, which means we are injuring it much less or none at all. And in fact, we have shown that in some cases we are allowing the organ to repair itself from its previous injury. So what was unusable before now becomes transplantable. Um, so that takes care of, addresses one part of the need. We now can use these organs that were originally injured, right? So that helps. Um, the second problem of our uh, bag of ice is that the, the, limi the time limitation of time, this hours of preservation. Um, so ideally you would want not hours, but days and weeks and actually infinite banking of the organs so you can do the perfect matching. Um, there are more urgent things like, uh, for instance, if we had a few days we wouldn't have to run exactly and it will be not an emergency surgery but something that can be planned to be done that would reduce the costs. And then there's the logistics of sharing. So right now, because of these hours of limitation, essentially each country or each state has its own organ procurement organization, and most of the donor organs are shared within that region. The New England organ has its New England organ bank, and the organs donated in this region are uh, used by the, um, the recipients in this region for the most part. It's almost impossible to share, not impossible, but it's rare that we share organs between, say, California and Massachusetts or Washington State and Florida because there's just not enough time to transport the organ and then do the transplantation as well. If we had enough time, we could share the organs with um, Australia, for instance, and why not if the best match is there? So we can't do this, uh, but nature can. Ah. This uh, little frog behind me is actually very famous. This is the work of Ken Sturitz. Um, the video is from the work of his lab. Um, the frog called Rena Silvatica, the Canadian wood frog, is famous because it can freeze in the winter and essentially warm back up and come back to life in the spring when it warms up again. Um, the lab recorded record is, I think, 200 days. So as you may be uh, seeing in your videos, um, these animals are frozen. Um, their heart has stopped, their blood is frozen. They look like little rocks. They look, almost look ornamental. Um, and um, there's no brain function or anything. And then you put them under a heat lamp or you know, the weather just warms up, whatever it is. Um, and they just start coming back to life. Um, it's almost like they went under a sleep. If you watch, you know, you probably have watched all these science fiction movies where we talk about cryopreserving humans for travel to Mars or outer space or something. This is exactly what these guys, we want to be able to do the same thing for, um, you know, for our organs as well as for the entire um, humans as well. Um, this turns out to be a much more complicated problem as, uh, than the frog makes it look, of course. Um, so, and there's like a 
again, decades of work, uh, essentially uh, trying to identify how the frog does this magic. It's not the only organism that does this, but it's really special in terms of how long it can do it. And um, if you try to do what the frog does with an organ, um, that's um, on the right corner, that broken thing is actually a pig heart uh, that uh, we tried to cryopreserve and it essentially broke because it's just not suited to, to these kind of things. Um, one of the things the frog does um, is just before it's about to freeze, its liver pumps up a lot of uh, sugar, glucose, into its system. Its cells take this up and use it as a preservative, a cryopreservative to stabilize their organs. And actually, um, although the blood itself froze, freezes, um, the organs themselves, the so-called parenchyma of the organ, usually does not freeze, which, is, which means it doesn't get damaged by all these changes of uh, turning into the solid state from its usual uh, you know, liquid jelly state. So we actually tried to replicate that. Um, we did manage to replicate that, I should say. Um, the, the organ in the blue ball, it's a human liver that has been supercooled. Um, what we did was we borrowed the idea of getting sugars into the cells. Uh, regular sugar doesn't work uh, because human cells are very finely precise to regulate our intracellular glucose levels. We instead use an engineered glucose called TRIOMG that actually gets and stays there, accumulates in the cells, and then took it down a few degrees below the freezing temperatures. So we take the organ from about plus 4 degrees Celsius of storage to about minus 6 degrees. That 10 degrees essentially doubles the time you can store an organ. So you go from like 12 hours to about uh, overnight or 24 hours or so. Um, and then you put this in this like artificial bodies that I showed before, the perfusion devices to recover it back and make it work again. We actually made this work successfully for rats. They transplanted these organs after supercooling and they survived happily ever after. Um, and for the human livers, this is actually the first demonstration. So we are excited that we are scaling this up and going towards more clinical applications of these things. Um, there is also a, a second generation and slightly crazier, crazier version of this where we try to do what the, uh, the rat does exactly, uh, where we actually freeze the organ. That little um, raspberry sorbet is actually a frozen rat liver. Um, the outside is frozen, the uh, blood in the vessels are frozen, uh, but the graft itself is not. And then when you warm it back up, tow it back up, it actually functions the way a liver does, meaning it does all these metabolic duties, it produces piles and so forth. Um, so with these, um, we think we can extend, with these, stuff I'm, uh, these techniques that I'm showing now, uh, we think we can extend from just a few hours to a few days, maybe up to a week uh, or two weeks. Uh, we are not the only people who are working on this topic, of course. For instance, for the vitrification, the scribe preservation thing I'm, you see in the heart, um, there are colleagues of us in the University of Minnesota, John Bischoff's group, they try to put, uh, no, actually what they have shown, that they can put nanoparticles in these uh, tissues and then microwave uh, these tissues. These nanoparticles make sure that the graft uh, homogeneously and very rapidly warms up and tow. So all this injury, the breakage that you see on, um, on the heart doesn't actually happen. So we are working on it. Uh, it. It took 50 years to get transplantation done. Hopefully we'll do the extension things uh, down soon. So uh, there is another application of extending the preservation. Now, as I mentioned, these uh, immunosuppression treatments were essential to be able to transplant bef between different people. Um, again, we are trying to sort of convince the recipient's body to stop trying to attack this graft that's saving his or her life. Um, the problem is these medications have very severe side effects as well. When you're suppressing your immune system, sure, it's not attacking your graft, uh, but it's also no longer um, attacking the infections that enter your body, which means you are now under threat of getting systemic infections. Uh, the same immune system is supposed to fight the potential cancer cells in your body and eliminate them. It can't do that as effectively, which means there's a much higher risk of cancer. Um, there are actually um, very significant and, uh, approaches that are in clinical trials right now to induce uh, tolerance through something called mixed chimerism. The idea here is to take the bone marrow cells, um, so along with the organ we aspirate a little bit of the marrow, and the marrow has these special cells that actually know how to teach your immune system to recognize 
the graft, um, the cells from the donor's body as self. Um, there are these proteins on all of our cells called major histocompatibility complexes. And these proteins are used as the so-called the driver's licenses of the cells. And that's how your immune system realizes this is myself, I should not attack these. Um, so the marrow cells that we take uh, enable doing happening the same thing. And they do work clinically, not all of the time, not in all cases, but some of the time, some of the cases. And this is how things start in transplantation. Um, this is, from a preservation perspective, this is an interesting problem. Uh, the thing is, we can take just a few of these marrow cells from a dead donor, um, and we actually need some time to prepare them for implantation along with the graft itself. Uh, it's at least three days, ideally about a week of time you need um, to, to take the cells out, expand them in vitro in large enough numbers, prepare for reimplantation along with the graft. Uh, that's time we don't currently have, because again, we are limited to ours. But if we can extend this to up to three days or so, then the tolerance protocols can be, as now, can be applied clinically in all cases. The, um, the benefit of tolerance isn't just uh, the second effects, side effects of these immune treatments, but also enabling certain kinds of transplantation. Um, so a good example is a patient of ours at uh, MGH, uh, Kurt Setrula, a good friend of ours. Um, he did do a hand transplantation for this patient. Yeah, he had left his, left, uh, lost his hands in the, um, the nightclub fire in Rhode Island in 2003. Um, and without both hands, it's, life is hard. You really can't do things that make you function uh, in this current society, right? Um, so um, Kurt was able to transplant a hand and he now lives a much more normal life and he can use the hand. What has enabled this is actually uh, new uh, medications that enable the tolerance of so-called vascular composite telegrafts. Um, so when you're transplanting hands, uh, legs, limbs, uh, face transplantations actually, um, there's a mixture of tissues that you're putting in the new body. There's skin, there's muscle, there's bone and those things tend to trigger the immune system more than what the liver or kidney does. Um, so they used to be rejected until these new class of medications came along. Um, the problem is um, the calculus of doing a transplantation changes. These are not life-saving organs. They just increase immensely the quality of life of the patient, but technically they are not life-saving. It's not a heart, it's not a liver. You can still live without your hands. So you are sort of risking the increased risk of cancer infection versus um, the quality of life, and that's a much more difficult uh, calculation. Because of that, the number of these uh, limb transplantations and VCA transplantations in the, I think, about 100 or so were across the world. Um, so if we were able to enable these transplantation, these vascular composite of transplantations, the demand is immense. A good example, again, is the Boston Marathon bombing. 14 people lost their limbs as a, fact, as a result of that bombing. And then there's the immense need in battlefield medicine and the Department of Defense and for our soldiers and veterans who live their lives as quadriplegics. And we could potentially treat all these people if we had these uh, technologies. Um, Last but not least, this is by Shuck's work. Um, this is addressing the supply problem and along with the potential the tolerance problem from the root. Uh, tissue engineering tries to manufacture, uh, cell, uh, manufacture organs in the lab. There are different approaches and again, this is just the stuff that we are working on. But what we do here is, um, remember all those organs I said we couldn't use because they were injured? Some of them, we hopefully will be able to use them by these perfusion technologies I mentioned. It won't be all of them. Some of them will be just too damaged to use. So what Bashak does in the lab is take these very injured, essentially dead organs, uh, very gently wash them with a detergent so that the dead cells are removed, but the exoskeleton of the organ is left. So the exoskeleton, the extracellular matrix, is uh, basically how they uh, is places the cells. There are little uh, locations for them in the cells. You can actually, if you look at it, the, you can see the vascular trees very beautifully. So on the top uh, behind me, we have the rat um, extracellular matrix after decellularization, before and after as it progresses. And below is a human layer that goes through the same process um, that gets the cells washed out and it's ready to be used as a scaffold for tissue engineering. The idea is, you get the scaffold, this ready-made place to rebuild your organ. And then we take a little bit of a biopsy from your skin. 
we transdifferentiate your skin cells into, say in this case, liver cells, uh, expand them in vitro, put them back in this uh, scaffold, and essentially recreate an organ in the lab. Now this is really hard. Um, it's a little bit like uh, constructing a big building. There's a lot of construction going around in Boston these days, and if you watch one of them, um, in the first like couple of weeks almost, they will build the scaffolding, the uh, foundation, and the walls. And then they will work for two years on the insides of the building. So this is the same thing. Uh, we have learned how to build the scaffolding for a skyscraper. Uh, we are trying to figure out how to build the electricity, the plumbing, the piping, the HVACs, and the elevators, and all that sort of thing. Um, the key uh, challenge here is actually the blood vessels. Um, to be able to handle blood in vivo, we need to cover the endothelial, the vascular lining very nicely, otherwise it clots, meaning that if you transplant it in your body, it will eventually clot and not be able to uh, get the nutrients and essentially die. So that's what we're trying to fix now. Um, they're at about 70 to 90% coverage and we need to get remarkably close to 90 per, the 100% to actually make it work. So this is a little bit longer in the future, but eventually it will hopefully solve all of our problems when it becomes a reality. Again, transplantation was a science fiction novel once too, and now it's reality, so th these things will come across us hopefully in our lifetimes. Um, so to summarize, at least what we are doing here, uh, is we are trying to re-engineer all these organs so that we can have more organs for all the donors in need, or the recipients in need. We can make them ready off the shelf where they are needed, when they are needed and we can work, uh, make them work without the need for immunosuppression and its harmful uh, secondary effects. If you want to learn more, there are a large number of organizations. Um, American Society of Transplantation is so-called the mothership. Uh, there are a number of advocacy organizations. Organ Preservation Alliance is one we work with closely. I want to mention the organ, uh, Procure Association of Organ Procurement Organizations. They are the people who handle the um, the really tough moral and ethical boundaries of uh, organ uh, donation and allocation and transportation. Um, I want to thank all of you uh, because at the end of the day it's the American taxpayer that's paying for all this research. We hope to do good with your money and hopefully you will consider it well spent. Uh, with that I think I'll stop. Before the video we'll have some questions I hope. Uh, you mentioned some of the uh, obstacles being like uh, ethical concerns. Like, what, what do people worry about, like, uh, what, with organ transplantation in that regard? Does that make sense? Um, you're asking the ethical limitations in organ donation or transplantation or research? Um, I guess the, the research, yeah. If we do a good job, I don't think that they will address the will address most of the questions. Let's put it that way. Um, I don't know, Heidi. Do you do you have a sense what would be a concern from the research perspective, apart from us not doing our job well? I guess. Um, I don't think there are so many ethical concerns with the kind of research that we're talking about here. But there's also a big effort to be able to transplant organs from animals, such as pigs, into humans. Um, and you can sort of imagine all the ethical concerns you could have about treating animals like that, how we can treat animals, and how people would feel about having non-human organs inside them. And a lot of that research involves using animals for research, and so there's all the ethical concerns around that as well. Yeah. Submit a question from online. Uh, so Donna from Facebook asked, uh, what happens if a donor is discovered to have uh, cancer um, after they've sort of already decided to transplant the organ? Do they, is that considered unusable or are they still allowed to sort of transfer an organ if they discover that the donor has cancer? If the particular tissue has cancer, then of course it's untransplantable. If it's another tissue, then it will depend on the chance of that transplant, it, uh, it also being present in the organ transplanted. Am I correct, Heidi? No. This is why I asked her to come here. Um, so most cancers have a fairly high risk of having what we call micrometastases, so there are cancer cells floating around in the bloodstream that we don't know about. Um, so most cancers will exclude a donor from being a, a donor um, because the addition of immunosuppression in the recipient increases the risk of that cancer growing and becoming more aggressive um, because part of the control system for controlling cancers is the immune system. 
Um, so there are a small number of cancers which we don't think um, are dangerous, and some of them are like very low-grade thyroid cancers. Um, a lot of the common skin cancers are often benign enough that we can still transplant organs from patients like that. Um, but, you know, sort of the classic cancers that we think about, colon cancer, or brain cancer, things like that, usually rule out donors. So you said that you can change the immune system um, to induce tolerance, but can you also do it the other way around, where you, um, if you have the um, organs on the machine, that you change the organ in such a way that it is matching the immune system of the recipient? Um, not easily, I would think. You would have to engineer the MHCs uh, during perfusion. Um, you could potentially deliver the bone marrow along with the organ or within the organ, um, the, the cells that um, educate the immune system, I think. Uh, but we haven't really explored it that much. It was, it was definitely a grant idea at some point, but we didn't really explore it that much. Um, do you want to say something? Yes. Heidi. Sorry. Um, I think one of the things we'd like to do is not so much make the organ match, because as Corkut says, that's very complicated to make all of the antigens match. But what we could do is put molecules that are immunosuppressing on the organ while it's on the pump so that it would become just locally immunosuppressive and you don't have to worry about immunosuppression in the whole body and it would just be um, localized and very specific to the transplanted organ. The other thing we want to do is actually take the organs that are not transplantable for different reasons, like fatty livers, and uh, eliminate the fat so they become transplantable. Or if they're a little bit fibrotic, maybe we can make them work again. These are different pathologies that require a different approach to just extending the duration of preservation, so it's a little bit more complicated. Um, so yeah, that's another approach that's being investigated by us and other, pe other groups as well. Uh, another question from Facebook. Um, what are the easiest organs to transplant? <laughs> Hi, this one's for you. I will say the brain, but I don't think that will be correct. <laughs> I, I don't think I should answer that question because no matter what I say, somebody will be offended. <laughs> um, you know, all the organs involve hooking up the blood vessels. Um, the unusual thing for lungs, for example, is that they're always is in addition to the blood vessels, you have to hook up an airway and get air exchange across the organ. Um, in kidneys, you have to hook up a ureter so that there's some way for the urine to exit the body. Um, in the liver, there is actually a dual blood supply, so there's an extra vascular step, and then you have to find some way for the bile to exit the organ as well. Um, I guess the safest thing to say is probably the skin is the easiest thing to transplant. Okay, I have one. Um, I guess, what are you excited for with regards to the next big breakthrough in organ transplantation? What, I guess, what, what excites you the most about where the field is going and are there any um, specific innovations, particularly ones involving technology that might make the process uh, much uh, simpler for, for patients and for uh, doctors as well? So I'm lucky to work in a field that I'm very interested in. And as an engineer, I find many different technologies that are all interested. I'm very happy that the perfusion technologies are in clinical trials, um, and they will become a reality soon. And all of our transplant centers will be using those and make more organs transplantable and better. Um, more specifically, Heidi and I have a grant that's testing a method to assess the organ. This is an NIH-funded clinical trial that's just starting. Um, here we will use the energy state of an organ to, as a marker to test if it's good enough for transplantation or not. I'm excited about this because so far we rely on essentially population statistics. So if a donor is too old or um, the organ has been on ice for too long, and that's not necessarily true. A very young donor with a perfect organ can actually, with a perfect health situation, can have an organ that can survive all of those things, but we just can't trust it. We don't want to risk the recipient's life. And we end up using some organs that are potentially not useful. So I'm very excited for that. Of course, it's a conflict because if it's, it's my own study as well. Uh, some of the organ preservation techniques that I'm very excited about because I feel this will be like refrigeration in the old times. In, when it was first developed, it was just a way to have more ice. And today, we can't really survive without refrigeration. It uh, permeates everything we do. 
So yes, there are a lot of exciting technologies, and I think this is a good time for most of those techniques to come to clinical reality as opposed to just science fiction ideas that require decades more of work. Yes, yeah, so I was just wondering, like, how does 3D printing techniques can be used in the transplantation? So, um, yeah, again, as I said, I'm mostly talking about things that we do in the lab. 3D printing isn't necessarily one of them. Um, for certain tissues, I think it will be perfect. Again, the idea instead of the idea is instead of taking these unused organs and using them as scaffold to do the 3D, 3D bioprinting yourself. There are some applications that I think it will be perfect for. Um, uh, things like more like skin and um, and um, and others. For organs like liver, it's a larger barrier for those techniques because it's a really large organ, it's a lot of size. Um, the vascular system is tricky, but then again, it is for other tissue engineering approaches the same. In general, the limitation in tissue engineering is to make the blood vessels work the way you do in our bodies. Um, all approaches attack the same problem with different techniques, different approaches. Um, I trust one of them will eventually work. It's, it's a little bit hard to, to exactly say this one will work and that one won't at the moment. You mentioned the um, twins with the kidney transplant. Um, I assume one of the reasons that was the case was because of the genetic match. Um, is that something that's considered with um, transplants going on today? Is there genetic analysis before a transplant? Or is the time so short that that's not considered? Uh, it depends on the tissues. In kidneys, there is more time to do matching, at least analyze matching. In heart and liver, I don't think there is enough time. So uh, there is another MALT score that sort of matches the donor uh, and the recipient risk. But I don't think it takes uh, the matching. Heidi, am I wrong? So we don't do genetic testing per se, um, and as a substitute we do um, immunologic testing. So we take serum from the recipient and test it for antibodies against donor cells. Um, and we do that both by flow and by cytotoxic T cell cross matching. Um, it's less important for liver, but um, they do it for heart and kidney, and I think maybe for lung. Um, for the kidney, as Corkett said, we have a longer time, so they actually do do antigen matching, and they will look at the, um, so the antigens that trigger the immune system most are called the human lymphocyte antigens on the surface of all cells, and they will actually type all the HLAs on the donor, and um, we do pre-testing on the recipients to see if they have preformed antibodies against those antigens. All right. Any additional questions? Okay, great. Uh, thank you all again for coming. Uh, big thanks again to uh, Dr. Korkut Yugen. Uh, it's Dr. Yaidi He and Dr. Basak Yugen as well for being here. Um, thank you all for coming out. Um, before we go, we did want to show uh, a quick little uh, prologue uh, from Transplanting Hope. Uh, again, uh, this uh, film will air on September 26, 9 p.m., uh, which is next Wednesday. Um, and it is a one hour uh, film that explores. Um, just put this up. Uh, that will explore sort of the uh, process around organ transplants and uh, follows the uh, journey of several patients who are going through the process and their families. So it's a really, really gripping piece. I'm um, really excited to have it on air. So please tune into that uh, September 26, 9 p.m. on Nova. Um, great. So I'll we'll just play the trailer. And then again, if you do have any additional questions, uh, I think Dr. Yugen will be here for a few additional yes, minutes. Yes, of course. To answer some questions. Um, and thank you for coming out. A newborn infant with a defective heart. Thanks. A transplant is your only hope. It's terrifying. It's just something we've got to do. We love her and just want her to have the best life she can possibly have. A heart is found that can save her, but it's hundreds of miles away. It's a desperate race against time. I've died. Steve. Is it all burned yet? An organ shortage means thousands of patients wait for months, even years. My destiny shall be open down. All patients will die. Please try to transfer. If she doesn't get this now, Within three months, I don't think she would be here anyway. 
or less uncritical it is. Can scientists find new solutions to the organ crisis? What we're talking about is having off-the-shelf tissues. That's awesome. Courageous families face wrenching decisions. Our whole world has been turned upside down. In a matter of moments, our life changed. Everybody pray. This is a loss of their son. So if we can have like five seconds of silence to just remember the gift that this family is willing to give through their son. And critically ill patients get a new chance at life. It's exciting to you know, transplants it up. And of course, it just saves lives and transforms lives. So, wonderful privilege to be a past that. Transplanting hope, right now. All right, and again, that's Transplanting Hope, uh, airs September 26, 9 p.m. on PBS. Please check that out. Uh, thank you all again for coming. Thank you for our Facebook audience for tuning in. Uh, if you're here, please feel free to ask uh, Dr. Yugen a few more questions, and uh, we'll check in with you uh, in October for our next Science Cafe. Thanks all. Thank you all.